Welcome back to another ComCom Virtual 2020 session. This time we've got Chad Hart from CWH Consulting with us, um, and he's going to talk to us about uh, what's happened with WebRTC over um, previous couple of months, um, as well as potentially what's going to happen in the future. So I'm just going to hand it over to Chad, um, and then we'll catch up with all of you afterwards. Cheers. All right, thanks, Dan. I uh, plan to set the stage a bit for how the pandemic is impacting the real-time communications industry. I can't see the future, but I'll at least try to speculate on what we can expect after COVID-19 finally dies down. Lastly, uh, for many, pandemic plus communications equals Zoom. Um, so I'm going to talk about Zoom a bit and what their, you know, what that company's success means for the rest of us. Just real quick, I guess on, on me and my background, I'm an analyst and consultant focused on real-time communications, uh, products and services. I focus on two main areas, WebRTC and the intersection of AI and real-time communications. Some of you may be familiar with uh, you know, some of my blogs like WebRTC Hacks, which is a, a blog for WebRTC developers uh, that I've helped to run since 2013. I also have another blog that specifically looks at um, topics on AI, machine learning, and the intersection of real-time communications. Uh, that's over at Cogent AI. Uh, and lastly, if you like technical talks, um, I also, you know, much like Dan, um, have a Cranky Geek, and you can check out the Cranky Geek YouTube channel. Uh, we're tentatively scheduled to hold a uh, virtual event this November. So let's get into the discussion on the pandemic and RTC. It was the best of times, it was the worst of times. And you know, th this phrase is really true. I'm a bit conflicted. Uh, the pandemic is so objectively awful for so many, but you know, at the same time, it's been extremely good for the real-time communications industry. And especially good for, for new forms of communication like video conferencing here. I started out pulling together some statistics on how you know, real-time communications usage has grown. Uh, and it seems like every major video conferencing vendor out there has published some figure on how their traffic has increased. The problem is everyone uses a different metric, daily active users, monthly minutes, new signups, and the numbers are, are massive, you know, millions of growth, uh, hundreds of millions, growth by 2x, 5x, and there are just lots of staggering figures. But at the end of the day, it's clear everyone's seen a major surge. And in aggregate, there's no question that, you know, video communications has hit an all-time high. It's also clear um, that this was probably a peak, right? Um, you, you, at some point, you can't keep adding new users. You can't keep adding minutes because, you know, there's just no population left or no time left in the day. I should also mention that uh, in this talk, I, I mostly talk about video calling, uh, video conferencing. There's a lot of video here. Uh, and that's because, you know, it's a newer phenomena. Uh, and to be honest, you know, video calls and video screenshots look a lot better in slides um, than trying to represent a phone call. However, you know, some of you might remember there was this network before, you know, IP made the internet. That was, you know, now we call the public switch telephone network. Um, and after steady, years of steady declines, even the, the lowly PSDN call um, is doing really well during the pandemic, you know, as, as evidenced by, I, I think, many carriers, but, you know, some stats you can see here from, from Verizon and, and at t Now, to highlight the impact of the pandemic in a little more detail, I want to, you know, focus on a few areas in particular that have the, you know, have the potential to drive a lot of change and, and have had a real impact uh, on real-time communications. The first is remote work, um, and this is probably something that you know everyone watching this video is, I'm sure, uh, experienced a bit by now. And I should say I, I've been working remote for close to seven years now, uh, so I only have vague memories of commuting into an office every day. So you know that's not a, not necessarily a new phenomenon for me, um, but it is a new phenomenon for a lot of people. And you know it can be hard to appreciate remote work in, until you've experienced it. And most people, you know, at least until COVID-19, had not experienced remote work. As you can see here from this Gallup poll, the percentage of workers who you know, work remotely doubled in March to, to 62%. Uh, and it's likely this percentage has only gone up in the last couple of months um, as the pandemics continued. 
Now, working from home has some great benefits for employees, right? Uh, for us as individuals, right? There's lots of extra, you know, time uh, from not commuting, just the, you know, the, the drag of commuting. Um, no, no one, no one enjoys that. Um, and just, you know, a more varied day, more flexible day can actually lead to greater productivity. However, the downsides um, of remote work tend to be the lack of colleague interaction or, or you know, difficulty of separating work and home life. And for you know, businesses actually uh, making the decision, do they allow their employees to work remote um, or not? I mean, it, here actually, there are a number of very clear advantages. If you think, uh, you know, just commercial real estate, very expensive, right? Um, there's a, a massive amount to be saved in just these costs alone. Not to mention, you know, that makes HR's job a lot easier if you can expand your hiring pool uh, to candidates outside of, you know, just one particular region, especially if that region is a very expensive area like, like San Francisco, right? And, and in theory, you get better employees, right? Because you get more flexibility, you know, um, and they're more likely to stay and retain if they're, if they're happy. The downsides are often chalked up to worse overall firm productivity, right? Because the, the theory is, uh, because teams can't coalesce and work together as well, uh, and because there's less inter-employee engagement, you know, maybe there's less overall innovation for the company. But many of these articles, uh, these these arguments are theoretical, um, and we're really undergoing a giant experiment right now. One thing is clear that there are many workers who are not going to go back to the office every day. Um, so this, this recent Gartner poll shows that almost half plan to increase their amount of remote work going forward. And companies like Twitter, Slack, Shopify, and, and others have made, you know, ha have announced that they're making remote work, you know, at least the option to work remotely, um, not just something for the pandemic, but something they're going to do indefinitely going forward. All right. So there's, there's really no doubt that we're going to, you know, we're not going to return to pre-COVID level traffic levels for remote work, right? It's going to be more, right? So it's really just a question of, of how much more. Now I'd like to transition to another industry, um, telemedicine. And now and I want to be clear here because in, in some circles, there's a technical difference between telemedicine and telehealth. I'm going to use those terms interchangeably here. Um, telehealth, uh, you know, telemedicine, um, this has been around for quite a while, right? Um, the, the, the telemedicine industry is already worth, you know, $3 billion a, a year. So I think maybe the bigger question is why hasn't it taken off yet, right? Why, why, what's so different now or why is it so big now when it didn't exist at all before, you know, other than the you know, immediate uh, causes of, you know, of, uh, due, to the, due to the pandemic? Well, you know, other than the absolute necessity, I guess there, there are some big differences. Um, and it largely comes down to bureaucracy and money. First, uh, med medical regulators, you know, groups like the CMS in the US, which governs Medicare and Medicaid, have, made, uh, a, have basically opened up a much broader variety of uh, providers and services that are eligible for reimbursement, right? There's money behind this. So, you know, for example, physical therapists, occupational therapists, like speech and language pathologists, they can all offer telemedicine, right? And, and previously, they couldn't do this because they wouldn't get paid. Um, the second big thing is governments actually are encouraging the use of telehealth, um, actively encouraging it and, and putting money behind it at the same time, right? This, this never happened before. And lastly, a lot of the regulations that have limited um, or at least made uh, telehealth harder uh, or, or added some extra steps like HIPAA have been loosened. And I, I personally kind of view HIPAA as more of a, a mental barrier for, you know, or, or excuse for healthcare providers than a real one for technology. Um, and, and to be fair, from their perspective, it's really just an added, you know, risk in some cases uh, or, or perceived risk for really what's otherwise a very successful business. So what's the point of doing anything different, right? Uh, so it becomes a very, you know, a very convenient excuse, but, you know, that, that excuse doesn't stand, doesn't work right now. So big question is, is all this temporary just during the pandemic or is it going to last? Uh, and some surveys from McKinsey indicate that actually this will last. 
now that you know they've been exposed, uh, practitioners that use telehealth um, or practitioners that plan to use telehealth um, or continue to use it jump from 11% to 76%, right? Um, and patients like it too. There's a 74% satisfaction rate um, there. And the reality is most doctors never really tried telehealth before. Uh, now that they've been forced to use it, it turns out they like it. Um, and you know, McKinsey here estimates that 20% of medical services in the U.S. could move to telehealth, right? That adds up to $250 billion of, you know, worth of, of new opportunity. The next area I'd like to look at is education. And the impacts of COVID-19 here have been particularly hard. Most schools, you know, especially those outside of higher education, just were not prepared at all for anything like this. Many of the prerequisites that are needed to make remote education work aren't just aren't there for a lot of kids. Um, you know, for example, 95% of students in Switzerland, Norway, and Austria, you know, have a computer for their schoolwork, but only 34% of kids in Indonesia do. Right? Um, if you're watching this video, odds are you consider you know internet connectivity a, a given. Um, here, but there are many remote and underserved areas that don't even get good internet access, right? So lack of devices, lack of connectivity, and all this makes remote education for primary school, in particular, uh, you know, primary schools, a particularly hard problem. The reality is the school system is just not set up for remote education, um, and we're a pretty long way from, from you know, fully getting there. Um, you know, certainly there's been some big strides and, and helping that has been some major funding efforts. Um, like for example, you know, again, this is another US example, uh, US example um, as, sort of, as part of some of the US education funding relief. But unlike the other industries I mentioned, there isn't really anyone advocating that we never send kids, you know, kids to school again, right? Um, th this, is, this is always, you know, framed in terms of being something that's temporary. Uh, and if anything, you know, there's groups like the American Academy of Pediatrics advising that overall we're we're better off sending our schools back, you know, better off sending our kids back to school this fall, despite the COVID risks. Now, outside of primary education, you know, the the story in colleges and universities is perhaps slightly better, but also very complicated. So, you know, most you know uh, higher education has greater financial means. Um, many of them also, you know, had some form of remote learning um, available to their students already. Their students generally have laptops, um, though internet connectivity may not always be great uh, as some of those students go home. Um, but, you know, the, the harder part for higher education is really around economics. Um, they generally have large, expensive campuses to run. Um, if they have remote learning, that remote learning is generally always far less expensive than in-person tuition, right? And if everyone's gonna be learning remote, are they gonna cut their prices? Um, if everyone's gonna be learning remote, you know, as a student is the one that you chose, this, you, know, you, you probably didn't choose it for this e-learning program, uh, you probably chose it for this campus. And if you're gonna be reevaluating your decisions, right? And, and there's no real switching costs or, or minimum switching costs from um, going to one school or another, like why wouldn't all the students just go to the best e-learning programs, right? And that would leave uh, most schools probably without, you know, many, many students at all, right? Uh, where you have a few schools that, that have, have all of them. Uh, so this is a, another really big, massive experiment that's taking place right now. Uh, but the results here are very much to be determined. Developers, 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 developers. Developers, 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 developers. Yes. Now, I'm not quite as excited to talk about developers as uh, Steve Bomber here at uh, Microsoft back in September 2000, uh, but I am very excited to talk about developers. And one of the uh, you know, one of the reports that I saw that actually GitHub, which as a reminder is now owned by Microsoft, uh, issued is uh, is you know, one of their Octoverse reports, and, and they had one of these reports about the pandemic. In addition to some interesting facts like 
that work days are now longer and, and even working on weekends is, is we're spending more time working on weekends. Uh, I was excited to see some references to popular open source real-time communications projects you know, things like Jitsi, which uh, um, I guess there's a, a couple of Jitsi talks taking place uh, during this series, right? Um, and you see other ones like uh, Big Blue Button, which is another open source, you know, uh, conferencing platform for education show up here. So yeah, th th this got me excited, but it also reminded me that, um, you know, periodically, uh, you know, I, I actually have some of my own research here looking at GitHub. Um, a data set of GitHub's repo activity can be found on Google's BigQuery. And periodically, I mine this data, look for interesting trends around WebRTC. And I won't have time because it would take quite a bit of time to go through the complete methodology here, but you can actually go to WebRTC Hacks and see some of my, my past write-ups uh, on this. And I'll, I'll certainly be writing up some of this new research uh, for this over the summer. But you know, essentially what I do is I look for keywords uh, in the repo like WebRTC or peer connection that are unique, that would you know uniquely identify a repo as being WebRTC or not. Uh, and I track activity based on that. And I can look and see if there's certain activity in a given month, uh, count users, count repos, that sort of thing. So uh, this inspired me to go and take a look uh, and update that research to see what impact uh, you know the the pandemic and COVID nineteen have had has had uh, on WebRTC and open source. So and it's pretty clear. You know, I looked at the data from from January to June. Uh, and unsurprisingly, things are up, right? Uh, with a particular peak you can see here uh, in April. Now, to be fair, WebRTC was already trending up, right? But uh, you know, this this has gone up quite a bit, both both across, I should say, repos and and users uh, who are, have some kind of activity within those WebRTC repos. So. There are some seasonal effects that always happen, right? Usually things like slow off a little bit in the summer. So I also decided to take a look uh, and compare the data to last year. Um, and this time around, actually, you don't see the summer slump at all. Uh, June was a it was a, an all time high uh, for the number of active repos. And, and keep in mind, these are repos where there was any kind of you know um, I, I track most events in a given month, right? Um, so. If you had some project you started last month and didn't touch it again, it would show up, you know, in June, but wouldn't show up in July, as an example. So, and um, and also did the same around active users, um, and we exceeded, you know, uh, more than ten thousand uh, developers um, who were involved with a WebRC repo um, did something with a WebRC repo uh, in April. Now this has gone down a, a little bit. You know, th this was a peak, um, but we're still way ahead of pre, you know, COVID nineteen levels here. I also took a look at some of the you know most popular projects uh, and how they were impacted um, during the pandemic here on, on GitHub, and you see a lot of the usual suspects like you know the WebRC project repo is always big. Um, well, as cons, you know, various projects show up well. Uh, Pion, actually, I think uh, you know, um, Sean will be speaking uh, here, uh, later on during this event series. Um, showed up well. Jitsi, which I talked about. Uh, Big Blue Button, uh, I also mentioned, right? So you see these, uh, all the spikes don't exactly line up. I mean, a April overall, but um, it doesn't exactly you know, line up there. But you see, actually see some good positive activity. And I was also very curious to see, um, not just which repos were you know people that use github looking at you know forking um commenting and that sort of thing i also want to see actually which repos were their actual code contributors right where, where were people actually developing uh, or, or doing something development related right and the github data includes all the very you know most of the various events uh you do so what i do here is just look for code events like pushes and pull requests and pull request reviews um, when you do this and filter it on that data, the landscape is very different, as you can see. Um, now, the projects that have the most actual developers, and again, this is unique individuals who contributed some sort of code uh, to that project uh, in a given month, right, uh, is very different. Jitsi uh, lands very high here. Um, you know, Pion again, uh, Miduko, Lorenzo, I think he, he you know, gave a talk some, some time before here. Right, and we also see 
even a Weber C, the SIP gateway project uh, for, for Camellio uh, by Hafo was, was another new one that I hadn't heard of um, that had a lot of, uh, uh, actually a lot of developers involved here. So, you know, I, I do think this helps to give a sense of, you know, ha have these development communities grown, you know, more than just users, are there more people actually developing, right? And we, we want to see this go up. Uh, and it looks like, you know, there's some some rough evidence maybe that's happening. And this also made me think, uh, you know, can we actually take a look and, you know, see what the leacher ratio is, right? So the idea of, you know, leacher, you know, really is the, the number of people who, people who actually use open source projects, but never give anything back, right? Um, so, Overall, uh, I looked at this total pool of users and tried to see what percentage of those users had some code activity uh, versus those that didn't have any at all, right? Um, not specific to a repo, but just looking at all the users um, in in this this sample. And surprisingly, actually, the, the leacher ratio remained fairly constant around you know seventy five percent, you know, meaning twenty five percent, you know, uh, of the users actually contribute some kind of code. 75% don't, right? They're just copying, you know, may, maybe commenting or just something, but they're not actually um, committing any, any code or, or doing any code reviews. So um, overall, I mean, I guess obviously we want to see this change and go down over time, but uh, at least it's not a, a bad symbol. And it shows the, you know, the, the COVID-19 didn't just introduce a lot of new leakers uh, who were, are, you know, never going to do anything. Um, it, that, Based on the numbers, that must mean that say there's a number of new developers on these repos as well. Now I'd like to transition and, and talk a little bit about Zoom. Zoom has had a lot of problems, uh, multiple security issues, false statements about encryption, user flows that you know made it easier for bad actors to Zoom bomb schools and cover meetings. They're really just like problem after problem after problem. And I, uh, part of this is like, you know, for, for those of us in the open source kind of general real-time communication industry, it's, it's a little frustrating because, you know, Zoom doesn't operate like the rest of us, right, in the RTC industry. Everyone else more or less coalesced around WebRTC and, you know, this, this one single open source project and work together to make it better. But that's not what Zoom did, right? Zoom has their own proprietary mechanisms. Um, and in some ways, like this litany of problems and, and challenges they've had is somewhat of a demonstration of why it's bad you know, to go out on your own and have, you know, not have peer review uh, and many people looking at your code and, and do things in a proprietary sense. Like it, it opens up the door for problems all of a sudden when something like this happens, right? So, you know, you would think this would be somewhat a vindication uh, for WebRTC, right, and, and vindication for open source. But the reality is users don't care, right? Um, and and it's, it's very real data, right? Uh, Zoom jumped from 10 million uh, monthly meeting participants back in December to 200 million in March and then added another 100 million in April. Now, you know, keep in mind, uh, meeting participants doesn't equal actual users, because most users have more than one meeting, but still, it's still, you know, major growth here. Um, and, you know, there's no doubt they're, they're not going to continue, you know, they're going to continue to grow uh, here. And, and not just users, I mean, the, the stock market has rewarded, rewarded Zoom tremendously, right? If you, you look at this chart here, and it is actually from, from May, but I just checked the numbers yesterday and still true. Zoom is worth more than the seven largest airlines put together. Right, not not just individually put together. Right, so a company that does video conferencing, um, all right, is worth more than all these airlines and all their physical assets and everything they do, um, and you know the hundreds of millions of people they transport all over the world. Right, Zoom is worth more uh, than all of them. It, it's just amazing, and I have to say it's kind of like I I probably have a little bit of envy, um, and I, I think others others should too. Like what what is it that Zoom is doing? That's so special. Um, why why do they get all the credit, right? What, what do we do wrong, um, and what should we be doing? And this is a well, it's it's, it's a tough question, and, and it also makes me wonder. Like, well, we, we've been working on this WebRTC C thing for for a long time, did, but did did Zoom win? Um, did did they win here? And that's probably a little more difficult question to ask. Certainly, 
Zoom won the stock market. Um, Zoom won the general public's mind share, um, but they haven't won everything. Um, so, and, and here, you know, here's one data sample. If, if you go to um, Chrome, actually has a, a Chrome, you know, platform status page, which actually look at specific um, events and usage. And if you look at things like here, uh, I, you know, I think I'm looking at the, uh, uh, you know, peer connection, you know, set uh, set local description uh, here, or set, you know, set remote description, and you kind of add up and do the page loads here. You kind of figure out, uh, and you're doing some some rough triangulation, and I should say you know, some of this data is also in, in BigQuery, so you can look it up yourself. Um, but you know, roughly, you know, calling the 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 get peer connection, um, you know, set remote description API resulted in somewhere between 250 and 300 million page loads, um, in you know, in a given month or so, uh, in that ballpark. And, and this is just Chrome usage, right? On, on you know, Chrome on desktop and mobile, but it's just Chrome. Um, and this doesn't include Firefox, it doesn't include Safari, it doesn't include Edge, and importantly, it doesn't include native applications that use WebRTC, um, which are, are, you know, likely outnumber uh, even the web use here, right? So if you add it up and you start to consider all the other, you know, big companies and vendors that use WebRTC, which again is like everybody else, um, but, you know, things like F Facebook uh, and Messenger, which alone has hundreds of millions of users um, out there. And, and all the Google properties and everything else, right? So, you know, overall, there's no doubt that actually there's far more WebRTC usage uh, than there is Zoom usage uh, in there in aggregate, right? Um, I, I don't know, is Zoom, what percentage of that? You know, maybe it's 10%, um, it, but it's still a big number. So it kind of makes you think, well, I mean, is, is Zoom on to something? Are they going to continue to grow? Um, you know, it's, it's going to make everyone in the real-time community communications industry just give up because they zoom one um, and kind of just see the market of them and move on to something else. And I kind of looked, I mean, uh, you know, obviously the circles I run in are, you know, hardcore rubber C people. They're very opinionated. So I was curious, you know, can, can I find a proxy to say, do, you know, developers in general care, you know, what do they think about zoom, uh, you know, versus WebRTC? Um, can we figure out something here, right? Um, or, or is it just me, you know, is it just me being bitter or is, does everyone else kind of feel the same um, uh, about some of this? So um, I actually found another great data set. Uh, you can actually get all the Hacker News comments uh, in there. So I decided to look, and it's not a perfect proxy, but it's better than anything else I could find to, to see, can I do a sentiment analysis on Hacker News uh, and Hacker News comments on Zoom versus WebRTC uh, and kind of see how people think, and, and curious to see how that would change over time. Now, first, um, I should say a couple things. One, I combine you know some terms into different groups. So, like, and in, in for comparison, I decided to throw in like Google Hangouts and Google Meet uh, into the Google category, right? And I have Microsoft. I've, I put Skype and, and Microsoft Teams in that group, but so I can just get get some sense. Um, and I filtered all the all the hacker news comments uh, around some of these key terms and these key categories, um, and I and included WebRTC and, and some of the major WebRTC terms in there, and, and included Jitsi, uh, which is always easy one to filter because Jitsi doesn't you know show up. Uh, like, like, unlike Teams, which is part of a gen, you know general vernacular, or, or something like Zoom, uh, where I had it filtered specifically on uppercase Z uh, as opposed to lowercase Z, which you know people zoom in on things all the time. Um, so I, I filtered this data um, and, and went through and cleaned it, and which just took me a lot longer than I thought. But it, it's pretty clear. You see here, Zoom is a mention is mentioned a lot. Uh, when Zoom had a lot of issues, they also you know jumped up quite a bit, and that, that was around this April time frame, right? And everybody else was kind of more or less you know kind of in the same category here. And, and so clearly, people are talking about Zoom a lot more. But are they saying good things or are they saying bad things? So I use Google's, um, you know, cloud, you know, natural language API to do a sentiment analysis um, on those statements, and kind of a typical methodology for doing sentiment analysis because you know, most people there's not a whole lot of you know meaning um, or sentiment positive or negative in most statements. So, uh, and if you include all the statements, it kind of 
makes the averages always close to zero. So a kind of typical methodology is to throw out everything um, uh, in the middle. So in this case, you know, I just did sentiment of uh, you know, less than 0.3 or greater than 0.3. Um, and you know, this is roughly about 16, you know, 17 percent of the samples. And you see here, well, I mean, it Zoom clearly like peaked in February, like the part of the pandemic. And I, I was surprised to see just how steady like the decline was. It just went down. Um, so clearly here overall, like sentiment for Zoom is declining. Uh, Weber TC, on the other hand, I you know, overall, the curve is really flat. Um, you know, I mean, it, it, it started out, you know, I guess high in January, this before a pandemic, it goes up and down. Really should look at this, uh, you know, a, a longer period of time. Um, so I, I guess I conclude here that, you know, developers in general, I mean, the, the general opinion of Zoom is not great. Um, maybe opinions on what we see are mixed, um, but they seem to be more or less steady, uh, at least in this relatively small data sample. Uh, so, you know, where does this leave us, right? I mean, it's really, in some ways, kind of like Zoom for versus everybody else. Um, I think there there is a lot of opportunity here. Um, so it's just we need to kind of continue what we're doing. And that leads me to, I guess, the, the, the final topic I have here. So, like, what's next? Um, we have a great opportunity ahead, but we're not going to beat Zoom without making something better, right? Without innovating, without, without doing something new. And there's still a lot of room for improvement. Um, we don't have remote meetings like this, right? Uh, being in a video call is not like being there for you or for anybody else, right? And there's a lot of things that are going to be hard or near impossible because of physics uh, to do for video callings. Like, it's, you're not going to be able to reach out and shake somebody's hands. Um, we don't have, like, smell a vision where you can actually smell, you know, and transmit the smells yet, right? Um, that, that, te uh, that technology is, is, is not there, or at least wide, widespread. But there are some things that are very possible that uh, I think we can figure out. I mean, one you see a lot of vendors doing is just like backgrounds and allowing users to choose backgrounds. And, you know, just like you walk into a conference room, you know, there's context, there's meaning behind that physical space, right? There's there's context and background, you know, and meaning in your background. So, you know, I'm, I'm showing my background here um, and instead of overlaying with something like that. But, you know, other people prefer maybe want to hide it, right? So there's a lot more intelligence, I think, that go into to backgrounds. Spatial audio is another thing. When you walk into a conference room, like you hear somebody in the left and there, there's volume differences, like we, we miss all that. Um, proper use of the self view. There's a lot of research that shows that it can be disconcerting for a lot of people to look at their own face, right? We, when we go to a meeting, we're not staring at a mirror all the time. Right? We don't have a mirror on the table to see how we're speaking, right? So it is all, in some reason, you need to have the mirror so people know what they are, but the same token, that's distracting, right? There's a lot we can do there. Gaze in general is a huge problem. Like yeah, I, I have to keep reminding myself to look up at the camera because um, my camera doesn't sit in the middle of the screen where I'm reading, where I'm looking, or where I'm looking at others. Right? It sits on top. Right? So the you have this this mismatch between what people are looking at uh, or who they're looking at um, and and what's being sent over the video. Right? Posture, position. We miss all that. Right? So you get you get from the you know, hopefully from um, from the trunk up. Right, but there's a lot of posture and things that are, that are missed. You know, micro gestures, all ambient audio, and, and even just enabling side conversations. Right, there's there so much more that can that we can do, and so much more we can innovate on. Not to mention so many different types of applications and use cases where WebRTC can be, and other real-time communications can be embedded where it's not. Um, so I, I, you know, I think there's there's plenty of, of things for us to work on, plenty of ways for for us in general to to, to beat Zoom. And with that, I guess I'll, uh, I'll I'll turn it back to you, Dan. Thanks so much, Chad. Um, I, I'm really, really happy that I asked you to to kind of delve deep into this uh, data set. Well, I didn't ask you to look at a certain data set. You went and did that yourself. I just went, hmm, seems like a lot of people are talking about Zoom. Seems like a lot of people are talking on Facebook. People are putting in forums. Like, can you, can you make sense of this? Um, so you were 100% the right person to do that. Um, and I can't wait for the Q&A um, straight after this. 
Um, so we're going to head over to riot.comcom.xyz um, for a QA. and a um, Meet us over there, um, where Chad will be available to, to talk about all of this um, and, and give you even more insight. Um, really, really insightful session. Thank you so much, Chad. All right. Thanks, Dan. Don't go anywhere quite yet, though. We've got to say thank you to all of our sponsors. With, without them, none of this would have even happened in the first place. So for our Platinum sponsors, we've got Tulu, Voxbone, and Ciara. For our Gold sponsors, we've got The Matrix Foundation, Vonage, Sangoma, Telviva, and Lowey. Our Silver sponsors are Aptise, Pion, Telco Bridges with ProSVC, Avoxy, 8x8 with Jitsi, and Firstcom Europe. And we've also got community sponsors, QXIP and Cycle Systems. Without any of them, this would never have even happened. You wouldn't have had all of this free content on YouTube. So go say thank you to all of them. Go look at what they provide, what services they offer, um, and have a, have a conversation with them all um, over on Riot, riot.comcon.xyz. The link will be in the description below, along with links to all of our sponsors. You can go and watch um, preview videos from all of our gold sponsors right now over on YouTube. The links will be somewhere over here. Um, all I've got to say is thank you to all of our sponsors. Um, and I'll see you over on the Q&A shortly. Cheers.